welcome back to Ravenheart Renditions, and we are talking with Hendrik Faryu again. How you doing, Hendrik? Pretty good. How are you, Andrew? Good. Good. I got uh, got through one holiday. Got through our uh, our live cast, which went very well. And I'm I'd like to throw a thank you to everybody that showed up, and we had a good time at uh, giving some woodworking tools and, and different swag away. Yeah. Uh, now on to the next holiday soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty close for you between. Uh... Thanksgiving and Christmas in the U.S. is not not many weeks in between, eh? Yeah, you get a little more of a break. Your your Thanksgiving is earlier than ours, if I remember. Yeah, we're right. kind of we're at least five weeks or so, maybe earlier than you. So yeah, we we spread it out a bit. We all call we call it the crazy season down here. It's just one thing after the other. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, more more people in the U.S. seem to travel for Thanksgiving than Christmas, don't they? Yeah, a lot of people travel for uh, for Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I, it's a big travel day. I know a lot of people that do travel for um, Christmas, but I, I guess around the Wisconsin area, a lot of people stay kind of close to home, so it's more driving across the state or from city to city than it is across the country, like a lot of the Thanksgiving stuff you see for. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then do you want to tell me about your... Uh deep fried turkey we mentioned at the last uh, show. Do you want to tell me about that later? Yeah, well, um I think I think we covered the DVD stuff a little bit, but then uh yeah, I definitely got to tell you about that. That actually went <laughs> pretty good. It was it was kind of cool. I'll, I'll see if I can get the picture my wife took at 1.2. I'll have to tell you about that one, but Okay. For, first, we got um a few different comments. The uh, both DVDs are are uh were given away at the in the last two live casts, and they went over pretty good. People really like them, and and uh, according to some of the comments that I'm seeing out here, I think they're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about some of the different things we covered on the DVDs and some of the other stuff. Um, just uh, the, the the last DVD, the the, the hand plane DVD, we did uh, do the announcement on the live cast and uh, the email hasn't went out with the code yet but the, if you're listening to this and you won uh you, the the code is on the way don't worry i'm just lagging behind but <laughs> but the, yeah, as, soon, uh, as soon as i get the code i'll uh, i'll just fire it off that nah, no problem but the uh, the comments are great there people are loving loving some of this stuff and we actually have a few questions out there too uh, okay. actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to read the comment and uh this one, the first one I'm going to read, I answered, and I'm going to read my answer to you as well. And then you let me know what you would do different or where I screwed up my answer. How's that? <laughs> okay. So this one is from Ray. And Ray asks, Andrew and Hendrick, just starting out, if you were to purchase three planes, which ones would they be? And thanks for the podcast. Well, you're you're welcome, Ray. And my initial response was, uh, thanks for the comment and question, and my opinion was first the first three I would get would be a block plane, a jack plane, and a smoother. And the reason that I gave was a block plane can be used for a lot of different things, including, you know, putting a chamfer on stuff, trimming end grain, jack plane because it's kind of a well rounded, you could use different blades to do for like a scrub plane, a four four plane or even a small joiner. And then a smoothing plane because well I like smoothing planes, and I know what I can do with them as far as cleaning stuff up. So I also yeah. said I would pose this question to you and see what you had to say about it, too. <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, I, well, I, I guess my thought is uh, the three planes I'd recommend would be whatever three I grab most often off my shelf, right? Mm-hmm. And I would say the one I use the, by far the most um, well, actually, it's hard to even say if this is the most, but n- my number four, I definitely use more than a jack plane, um, probably just because it's um, a little more convenient size. Um, I know a lot of people would maybe, if they could only have a four or a five, they'd probably go with the five, but I find the number four a little more versatile for, mm-hmm. you know, a mixture of different sizes of work, you know. Sure. And then, and then the the block plane I agree with, but I I really feel like I have to have the the standard angle block plane and the low angle, and I find it hard to live with uh, just one and not the other. Mm-hmm. So you know, I usually tell people starting out if they're on a tight budget, they can buy just a low angle block plane and buy an extra blade, and sharpen the uh, blade of the uh, sharpen the second blade an extra. 
eight degrees steeper. And now when you put that in the plane, it'll operate like a standard angle block plane, even though it's a low bed. Sure. Um, but, you know, I, honestly, there there are days where I've got both planes out and I'm using them constantly, like mm-hmm. interchangeably between end grain tasks and long grain tasks. Sure. So the idea of having to switch blades even to me is very impractical for, for the amount of time I use both. So. I would probably say a number four and both block planes, low angle and regular. Okay. Um, but if someone, you know, really didn't mind switching blades on the block, then maybe I would take a number four and a number five. Okay. You know? and, and that's, I actually uh, said as far as the sizes go, <clears throat> my jack plane, I said like a five, five and a half and a smoother probably four or four and a half. Right. And, and that was, okay, so we're we're kind of thinking the same, except I guess I was thinking if you wanted to have one, like that jack plane, I was thinking you could do kind of, you know, like the rough work with more, and, and then you could, do, you know, if, if you were going to do more hand plane work, I yeah. guess if you were going to do more of a blended shop, it would make a lot more sense to kind of go toward that, you know, because a lot of that bulk of that work is going to be done by the machines anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, I plug in the old joint here when I'm ready to do the rough work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm not shy about it, but uh, um yeah, and you mentioned the four, four and a half. I mean, it's amazing how many students they've had over the years that went to a woodworking show and they were thinking of buying a four or a four and a half and the uh, vendor talked them into a four and a half, right? Mm-hmm. It could, could be a Lee Nielsen or Veritas or uh, whatever. But they come to my shop with the four and a half and also when they're buying a really good quality plane, they tend to be quite heavy, you know, because yeah. they're well built. So. Yeah nice thick sole and everything else but pretty soon they they, you know they're using their four and a half and then i'm using my number four um, record plane it's not even a high quality one but it's very well tuned Mm -hmm. and and it weighs way less than theirs and it's amazing how after a while you know they're kind of getting tired pushing their wide plane (laughs) wide heavy plane around yeah and they see me using mine and then i say here try mine for a second and they use it and they're like wow this is like just so much less uh physically demanding to use yeah you know i have small hands and i'm not uh you know a football player kind of guy and uh frankly i i prefer a plane that's on the light side and even though it's a bit narrower Mm -hmm. you just don't always have the strength to to push a wide plane blade over the wood uh, in hardwood so i'm uh i'm pretty much a fan of a four over a four and a half but uh you know i think the four and a half is good for people who are strong really big and strong and have huge hands but (laughs) for me i find it overkill a little bit (laughs) well i got i've i've got the Actually, underneath the bench, I've got a five, a five and a half, a four, a four and a half. You know, so I've got, I think I've got a six and a seven under there too. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it all depends on what I'm doing and some of this stuff. I mean, it, you know, my five and a half, I love because I have it set up with a somewhat heavy camber, and that's for knocking stuff down. Right. And it's, you know, you're putting something behind it and really whamming away at it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Like you're using a handsaw almost. Yeah, you know, you're, wham, 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 you're trying to knock the knock the high spots down on stuff, and then the five comes out for some of the other stuff. And same thing with the four. If I'm going to, you know, do more, it's set up a lot less refined than the the four and a half. I'm sorry, is is set up a lot more refined than the four is too. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to try these different planes out, but. Uh... Yeah, for sure, the number four and the two blocks I use just nonstop. You know, mm-hmm. I can't live without them. And, uh, you know, another plane that isn't something I use nearly as often, but it's quite vital when I need it, is my uh, my shoulder plane. I've got a medium Veritas shoulder plane. Mm-hmm. I've got a medium and a small, but frankly, the medium one, I'm just constantly grabbing for that. So, you know, that's when someone's getting into tendon work, not... Yeah not sort of your everyday run-of-the-mill stuff, but yep. uh, when I do tenon work, uh, it's really... I used to do it without a shoulder plane, just using a block plane and chisels like to trim the cheeks, and mm-hmm. once I got that shoulder plane, it's just amazing to have. Yeah, shoulder... <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the shoulder plane, I've got the... I think the... Well, it sounds like the same one, the medium uh, shoulder plane. And the other, the, for joinery, for that one, and then... Um, my router plane, when I'm doing handwork for joinery, I love that thing. Okay. And it just, if I'm doing, it, it, I guess I don't use it as much when I'm doing machine stuff. 
Right. But if I, because there's times I just, I don't feel like making noise and I want to, you know, work with the, the hand tools more. And that, I love my router plane for that. And it's not, right. like you said, it's not even one of the high end fancy ones. It's an old Stanley thing that I picked up. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, good. Yeah, you, you, I, mean, I don't know. I've got maybe, um, I've lost count. I must have at least 20, 25 planes, maybe. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, there's only. There's some that are your go to ones, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. There's my, my three go to's, and then there might be a total of seven or eight that I use quite regularly. And, you know, some are just extras or doubles or whatever. And yeah. They look good up on the shelf there, but they're not <laughs> used, not constantly used, you know. Yeah, well, that's like my joiner plane. I've got, you know, I've got the big joiner plane, and yeah. I don't use it very often. But when I do, I sure am glad I have that thing. <laughs> I don't even have a joiner. I have a number seven, which is pretty close. Yeah, but, and uh, mine, mine is a seven too. I don't have the, okay. the big number eight either. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've had a few students over the years bring in a, a Lee Nielsen number eight, which is ten pounds, and yeah. it's just a. Is monster. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, but <laughs> why is it hard to push when you're, yeah. you're not used to it? You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My uh, my go-to block plane actually is uh, I there's a guy Scott Meek and he makes uh, wooden hand planes. Okay. And, and he just started offering some some classes, online classes, and other ones to make them. But I picked up one of his when he started doing some of this stuff. Picked up one of his wooden bl- uh, block planes, and that is my go-to plane. That thing is, I love that block plane. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So, well, I guess we uh, on to the next one. Uh, John wrote us a question. He says uh, he said hi, and then I have a question for Hendrick, and he says I am planning on making a new tabletop for my dining room table. First, he asks, how would I plane it flat? Then he also says, I will be milling the boards and gluing them together. Uh, is this technique covered in the DVD? So first, if it, is it covered in the DVD, which I'll let you answer that one. But <laughs> Well, I have my first DVD uh, called Jointer and Planer Secrets. So that one takes you through the whole process of milling boards to build a tabletop and then how to glue it together. Mm-hmm. And then the hand planing techniques, which is the most recent video, um, you know, covers tons of hand planing, different hand planing techniques. But one of them is definitely how to flatten a tabletop. And I think I spend over an hour just on that process alone. So it's, it is covered there in pretty detail. Yeah. And I don't remember if it was during the podcast or after that we were talking about that, you know, you you, you just said of just that, that you covered the tabletop. In one of your first, you know, in your first DVD, and then later, how many years later, actually, you covered yeah, the, how to fly. Five years later. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, because the first one was all about jointing and planing technique, mm-hmm. and as part of the bonus footage in that one, I said I'm also going to show you how I, um, how I plan building a tabletop, like in terms of alternating growth rings, um, keeping all the milling direction the same, um, trying to grain match, all that. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I take you through the entire glue up. But then at the end of that video, you know, I was like, okay, I've already covered joiner and planer stuff. Um, I can't really get into the hand plane stuff because that, that's a whole other <laughs> massive video probably, which I finally covered five years later, you know, just came out in September. So, um, yeah, so the, you need the first video, joiner and planer secrets, just to uh, learn how to build a tabletop or how to edge glue anyway. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then the hand tiny techniques one definitely uh, has a huge section on how to level a tabletop. Okay. Well, is uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He asked, you know, how do how do you plane it flat? Now, obviously, you know, you you go over quite a bit of this in the DVD, and you, and yeah. you cover a lot of it. Is there any pointers or or quick thing you can tell him to kind of look out for while he's picking stuff out or starting this before he hopefully goes and orders it up and then he knows the rest? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is, um, you know, what I first do is I put a straight edge across the tabletop. Usually the boards are quite straight lengthwise because uh, everything was jointed and planed quite accurately. Mm-hmm. But usually the largest errors are across the width of the table. It's either, you know, cupped like concave or convex or twisted or who knows. Um, so the first thing I do is I put a straight edge across the width in many different places, like all the way down the length. And I measure, you know, in the video, I measure with with uh, feeler gauges to show 
that in this area here, we've got a gap of eight thou. In this area here, you know, the straight edge is actually touching the wood. And basically, the high points that are touching the straight edge are the points where we have to concentrate our planing and bring them down until we get to the low points, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm basically going over the whole table with a straight edge, marking the high points with a pencil, and then I'm working on those areas. And I, I start by planing on a 45-degree angle. So I'm, I'm actually hopping from board to board, um, and that allows the sole of the plane to kind of register from the low points to the high. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the, the blade cuts the high points and doesn't isn't able to reach down into the valleys of the low points unless you know unless the plane has too short of a sole. So that's why you want to use a number at least a number four, but maybe even a five or six if it's a big table. Yeah. So yeah, I take you through the whole process of planing on the diagonal in order to. Uh, get the thing roughly level, and then at the very end, just uh, hand playing with the grain down the length of the entire table. But because of, uh, because of grain switching, grain direction switches, um, sometimes that last step is actually bet better avoided because you can just suddenly get some nasty tarot right at the end. Mm -hmm. And you don't get tarot if you're playing like totally 90 degrees to the grain surface, which is a whole other technique called traversing when yeah. you're working side, like cross grain. Mm. And, uh, you know, even though it leaves a rougher surface, it does not tear out, which, you know, if you've ever gotten a tear out like a sixteenth of an inch deep, you know mm -hmm. how fast that is to recover from. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of show in the video, you can now do strokes with the grain, um, but sometimes it's so risky it's not even worth it. You should just switch to sandpaper, which, you know, mm. to a lot of hand plane purists are going to say, what are you talking about sandpaper? <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I believe you kind of need both. And the hand plane, for me, is a leveling tool. And with the perfect uh, piece of wood, yes, I can get it incredibly smooth and not have to sand. But in real life, usually I'm going to scrapers and sanding still, even after the, the leveling steps, you know. Mm -hmm. Because the scrapers and the sandpaper um, do not tear out, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have to kind of know when when to leave the one tool and switch to another in order to cut your losses, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I go through all all that, and um, yeah, like I said, it's over an hour long. It's uh, kind of a, a video within a video, right? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully he can he can pick that one up, and then it'll help him do the rest of it. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, and I mentioned before, it's only fun for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> for, for the, hand, the hand planing is fun when you watch someone do it. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're, when you're actually slugging it out on a seven-foot-long table, 42 inches wide or whatever, it, it, it is pretty hard work. Mm -hmm. So especially yeah. in you know, maple or oak or something hard, it's... Oh, it's not all that romantic anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oak. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd want to think about doing oak, play hand planing the oak. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, it's a uh, it's a good start is to analyze the surface. You know, like I'm always checking the surface with a straight edge, and like in the video, I use feeler gauges just to 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 show the viewer how I, you know, how much it's out. Like using feeler gauge measurements. But in, in real life, I'm not using feeler gauges. I'm just looking and saying, okay, here there's a gap, here there isn't. Yeah. Put the pencil on the high points and let's start working at it. Yeah. Um, but the key is to check with the straight edge constantly as you're working because it's it's amazing how quickly the shape of the surface changes. And mm -hmm. you can actually go too far and start, you know, kind of nose diving on an angle down around the edges of the table and stuff yeah. like that, yeah. making it worse. So. Yeah, it's easy to come off wrong. And oops, oh, no, I just made it con. <laughs> concave instead of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or come yeah. instead of come. Basically, just uh, check often and gauge your progress and work towards flat. And and then you got to also realize that there's there is such thing as flat enough. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> like I, you know, I I sometimes I do a very small tabletop in a course or whatever, and I can get it flat within about two thou total if I want. Mm -hmm. And and that's not so bad on a, a small table, like 16 by 32 or something, mm -hmm. like a little side table. But on a dining room table, if I'm flat within, you know, 15 thou total across a long distance, I'm happy. I mean, there there is a point you just say enough. <laughs> you know, the person buying this is not going to have a straight edge handy. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have to know when it's when it's close enough for uh, for the purpose, right? Mm-hmm.
Yeah. And if you feel yeah. bad, go to a go to an antique store and bring a straight edge with you, and you'll see how bad things are out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you'll feel better. <laughs> yeah. Some of the stuff you oh yeah look at that there is a spot there that they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You put a put a plate on the table and it slides right off. <laughs> Well, we got some other. Uh, first off, we got some. Uh, one more question. We got some pretty nice comments along the way here. Uh, Grayson says, "Wow, uh, sounds like an interesting video. I need to listen to the rest of the videos from Hendrick when I get a chance." And um, Bill wrote down, "I need to get some uh, experience with hand tools. I can see you and Hendrick being regular, and it's going to help a lot." Which uh, we thank anybody for the comments, and it's it's nice to hear that people are listening, and, and it's appreciated. So, the last question that we have out here is uh, Edward. Edward wrote, <clears throat> um, "Let's see. First off, it's always nice to know there's great woodworking sites you can get information from." Well, thank you. Um, but the question for Hendrick is, uh, does he have a way of sharpening jointer blades? Um, well, I, I have a way of honing them while they're in the cutter head. Okay. And sorry, what was his name, Edward? Edward, yep. Yeah, what he what he should do or what what all the listeners should do is um go look up the Fine Woodworking magazine from exactly a year ago. Okay. So I think it's the December issue of of twenty eleven or I think it's a combined issue, December, January. Mm-hmm. But anyways, you know, go on the Fine Woodworking website and Google or, or do a search on my name and all the articles I've written pop up. Uh-huh. And there was one published a year ago called um, Honing Joiner Knives in Place, like in the cutter head. Oh, okay. Okay, so... Actually, I think I remember seeing that one. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that, that uh, issue is on the shelf over there. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that article was supposed to include... Um, honing joiner knives and planer knives in the cutter head. Last minute, something came up with the editors and they needed an extra page in the magazine for something else. I forget okay. what happened. Uh-huh. So they, they bumped the planer part and the, instead they put it online and it's free. Like you don't have to be an online member to read it. Oh, okay. So you can also find another article online on fine woodworking on um, honing knives in the cutter head of a, of a planer. Oh. Not a portable planer, but like my, you know, I have a 20-inch planer. Yeah. But anyways, a lot of these, first of all, the techniques on my joiner method applies to all joiners, whether it's 6-inch or 8-inch or 12-inch, doesn't matter. Okay. The planer one, you know, when you read it, you'll see that you could make it work for portable planers as well, but you'd have to size the jig that I came up with a little differently. Okay. Anyways, I still to this day take my knives out and send them to a sharpening service because usually they are chipped enough oh. that I don't want to spend hours grinding them myself. Yep. You know, because I use water stones or diamond stones, that kind of thing. Yep. Then when I get them back from sharpening, they're actually not that good. You know, <laughs> like they, they've removed the chips, but they've left burrs on it, mm-hmm. and they've probably sharpened it to maybe three or 400 grit at best. Okay. So then I hone them further on my water stones, up to about a thousand grit, then I install them. But the good news about those articles is that, I mean, this has only been maybe a year and a half, two years since I developed these techniques and these jigs. I'm now honing the knives in the cutter head about three to four times before I take them out again. Oh, cool. So for a hobbyist, that could easily, oh, God, I mean, yeah. a, lot, a lot of hobbyists go a couple years on one sharpening. Yeah. You know, which they probably shouldn't. They probably should sharpen more often than they are. Mm-hmm. They just can't stand having to change the knives, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if they if they could hone them three to four times in between sharpenings, like I do, for me that only buys me a few months because I do this all the time, like mm-hmm. every day. But for them, that could actually buy them three or four years or oh, more. Yeah. yeah. So those techniques are are pretty handy, but they're kind of hard to describe in words. I mean, if you if mm-hmm. you find those articles, it's going to be much nicer because you got pictures. You'll see the the jigs I came up with to do this kind of stuff. So, okay. really helps. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, I uh, I hope uh, I hope Edward get it gets a chance to listen to this, and uh, that, that's that's helpful. And <clears throat> I know my my joiner. I haven't. I put new blades in, and like you, I I got the new blades, and I'm like, well, they're not really all that sharp when I got them, so I touched okay. them up. And you I have brand new ones, brand new blades that you yeah. bought, or you mean you had them sharpened? 
<clears throat> I had I I bought the the planer. I had them sharpened, and the okay. same and the same thing like you, you like you had. You know, they're yeah. well, they're sharp, but they're not sharp. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I haven't had to mess with the joiner since then, but my um. My planer, I won't have to worry about making a jig for because that's got a helical head, and I just turn them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've also got, in addition to my 20-inch planer, I've got a DeWalt 735 as well. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that's a quick, nice change system. So you just, they're double-sided knives, and when they're dull, you just turn them around. Yeah. There's a there's a hole in the center of the knife that sits on a pin, so mm-hmm. those are not even sharpened. They're just disposable, and that's, you know, that's a great way to go. Yeah. But for my big 20-inch planer, to buy new knives can easily cost $150 or more. Oh, yeah. And they do have jack screws to set the knife knife height. So I do have to go through all that mm-hmm. with my planer because the cost of new knives is at least double the sharpening cost, if not a bit more. Yeah. So yeah. I do have to do it. But, I mean, the planer is so big that it lasts, it lasts me for months on one sharpening, and now I'm honing it three or four times. So I, I can actually go a year and a half to two years sometimes. Yeah. Which one, is pretty good. One nice thing yeah. is, I know I'm gonna have to get new. Um, uh, like you said, for I have a small six-inch, you know, delta joiner, and and I had them sharpened once, and now I'm thinking, you know, as cheap as the blades are for mine, I'm probably just gonna end up getting a new set the next time that I need to do this. And one thing about that that's kind of nice for the smaller joiners like mine, yeah, you replace them, and you go through that whole setup thing again. Right. And although it takes time, you know, okay, if I did bump it along the way or if something got out of whack somewhere, I'm putting new blades in or even if you're taking them out and getting them sharpened or if you're touching them up yourself, um, you're going through the whole process of making sure, okay, we know it's at 90 again. I know that everything's right. I'm not going to catch it anywhere or nothing like that. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if somebody didn't have any nicks, I mean, you know, just taking them on a um, a water stone like, uh, like a plane blade or anything else is... is pretty much what you'd be doing, right? Yeah, but I mean, if if you, if I can hone them while they're in the cutter head, the benefit is, first of all, I reference off the outfeed bed with the stone. Oh, okay. So the knives are incredibly parallel to the bed automatically just from the process that I'm using to do it. Oh, cool. And secondly, I avoid having to take the knives out, yep. sharpen them, and put them back in. You know, like I, I've heard people say that they changed the joiner knives in 10 minutes and everything was perfect. I don't believe them. Yeah, I I, th- I think they're lying. <laughs> yeah, I put mine in and I remembered. I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> I got to do uh, that again I'll someday. T- <laughs> I'll tell you that it, it takes me about two hours total to do my joiner knives, mm-hmm. eight-inch knives. I'm talking take out the old knife, clean the cutter head, you know, get all the pitch off of it. Mm-hmm. I take out the jack screws, put them in some lacquer thinner for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and dissolve it. Then I take my newly sharpened knife, which isn't really sharp, so I hone it some more. Then I install it. And, you know, they got to be dead level to the bed. Yep. And they've all got to be the same height. So it's basically a two-hour process for me, including a bit of maintenance on the jointer. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can do the honing method that I show in that fine woodworking article in maybe half an hour max, like total. And they are razor sharp when I'm done. Like literally, it's it's sharper than something I'd get if I bought it brand new. You know. Oh, cool. Like That's... when you buy a knife, like for the Dewalt 735 uh, disposable knife, they are super sharp. They are yeah. amazing. Yeah. But, but when you buy a six-inch joiner knife or an eight-inch joiner knife, they're not even near that. Like they're just barely. Yeah. Uh, like, like they're clean. They're not like covered in burrs or anything, but they're not really, really sharp. No. And when I get them sharpened by a sharpening service, they're even worse than a brand new knife, like far worse. <laughs> it's like they just ground ground back the original bevel angle and then just left it, and the back's got burrs. Like there's, you can see metal filings sticking up on the tip, put it that way. <laughs> That's how I normally get them back. And I've tried probably five or six sharpening services, hoping somebody else would be better, and I can't seem to find anyone well, the, the, that the, good. The local one I went to was a little better than that, but not much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why you know people say, well, why do you send them out then? Well, it's because if I have a giant nick in my knife, I can't get that out just using my diamond stones. It would just take too long. Mm-hmm. I would have to have some kind of grinding system to do it, which is maybe not too bad on a six inch knife, but really hard to do on a twenty inch knife on my planer. Yeah. Like you gotta have, you know, some sophisticated equipment to do that. Mm-hmm. So 
I get them sent out. I feel like I'm wasting my money, but at least I'm getting all the chips ground out. I can do the honing fairly easily myself and then put them in, and they're really sharp. Sure. Right? But ever since coming up with this, these me- methods of honing them while they're still in the cutter head, that takes all the time of the setup away. Cool. You know, well, I'm being to... able to just spend half an hour on it and it really, really sharp, yeah. and and also not having to level them, you know, it's it's a huge bonus. So yeah, I'm gonna have to go out there and you gotta look up those articles. Yeah, so. I gotta try that one next time instead of because I know I'm like, well, it's I either gotta sharpen them up or get new ones, one of the two. And if I can take a half hour to sharpen them up instead of the, like you said. Two hour, you know, hour to two hours of take them out, go and yeah, get yeah. new ones, put them in. Uh. <laughs> no, once, once you get the technique down with the joiner, it's it's really, you know, like six seven minutes per knife, and um, and you know, you, because they're high speed steel, you really should use like a diamond stone. Mm-hmm. But I have done it using a normal, um, like a Norton water stone. Mm-hmm. It, it takes more strokes, but it still does it. I mean, it really wears the stone. You can see the stone. You're almost taking shavings right off the stone, you know. <laughs> but still, it does work. So it's not like you have to invest in all kinds of special equipment. Yeah. And and really, I I say that 1,000 grit on a joiner or planer knife is plenty. Like you don't need to go up to 8,000 like a hand plane. Okay. I think it's just overkill for for a machine that's rotating that quickly. Oh, cool. So I really only do one grit, like just 1,000 grit, and that's it, and I'm done. You know, if you had a huge chip that you're trying to get rid of yourself, then mm-hmm. you might want to put a 200 grit diamond stone on there and grind away at it and then go higher. But like I said, for me, it's not so much getting rid of chips. It's just sort of getting it sharp again, and that's it. Yeah. If it's got a big chip in it because you hit a nail or something, then it really should be sent out to be ground down so it doesn't take you forever. Yeah, and then it's safer, too. You don't have the possibility of hitting that thing again. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's, that's another, you know, very very common email I get about my first video, Join Your and Plane Your Secrets. Mm-hmm. First one is, how come you didn't show how to hand plane the table at the end? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, because that would take another five hours. <laughs> and then the second most common question is, how come you didn't show how to change the joiner knife? <laughs> you know, because I didn't. I, I showed how to use a joiner and how to use a planer, and it's extremely detailed. But I don't go into knife changes or maintenance, right? Well, and, 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 the, and the, the, the reason I didn't is that, again, people maybe forget, but that was the first video I ever put out. I had no idea yeah. if it would be profitable, if it would sell, <laughs> if I was just going to go down in a ball of fire. I had no <laughs> clue. So I was not going to put out a 10-hour video as my first attempt, right? Yeah. It's four and a half hours long, which is enough. So <laughs> now I'm starting to come back five years later and fill in some of the info. That, that some people wish was in there, right? Yeah. Well, and that, and too, if if um if you would have covered it, then you probably would have had the question that okay, you covered it on yours, but why didn't you cover it on my grizzly yeah. one? Or or <laughs> I have a delta one and you don't, and I need to know how yeah. to do it on this one because <laughs> I don't have yeah. one of those. <laughs> like my my second video was on uh, table saw setup. Mm-hmm. For that one, I had my delta unisaw, and I also had uh, brought a steel city table saw into my shop so I could well, for one reason was that I didn't want to change the setups of my machine because oh. it's so perfectly set up right <laughs> so I wanted to show it on another saw but also it was handy to show people like two different brands with some slight differences too sure but you know even that even though I went into all the setup then there's always someone emailing saying how come you didn't show how to change out the bearings or you know stuff like oh, that like repair yeah. work yeah <laughs> I'm like it has to end somewhere. Yep. <laughs> there, there is a point you'll have to call a repairman in. I, I sh- can't cover everything. I know? should have had the camera going. I I actually have a Steel City table saw, and when I bought it, it was the, the one and a half horse. Okay. And I upgraded it to the three horse and the, the, with 220 instead. And, and I'm happy that I did it. And it has, I, before I used to, you know, just normal feed rate on maple, I would burn no matter what I did and now I can normal feed rate and I have no problem at all. <laughs> right. There isn't much it can't cut through anymore I think yeah. but I wish I would have had the camera going if nothing else for comedic purposes of trying <laughs> to balance the motor and get it in the one spot when you get that one stupid bolt to go. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> then you can move to the other side because until then you got to I had a rope on the ceiling holding one end because I was doing it by myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
I, like a good YouTube video. Yeah, it was. Um, all I thought was, thank God that there's no power to this because this would be so dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, speaking of uh, uh, side side things that we were doing, I um, the holidays are coming, and the holiday that just went past. <clears throat> yeah. I uh, I mentioned last time about the turkey. Yeah, yeah, I was curious about it. Yeah, the um, the, the turkey, turkey. Yep, deep fried turkey. We had three gallons of peanut oil that it took to uh have it we we just we put the turkey in the in the the big turkey thing my my wife got me yeah. a turkey fryer and i believe that was 3 years ago now <laughs> that i haven't done <laughs> anything with it <laughs> yeah. um so we decided we we're going to try to deep fry our turkey and we we um we you figured, killed it first right yes we did kill it first <laughs> <laughs> we um i read up online all the all of the things and i guess the two biggest problems that people have are uh, one, they put too much oil in. Okay. So what you do is you put your turkey in first, then you put the water in there to make sure it's covered, and then you measure how much water you had so then you know how much oil you'll need. So that way you're not dumping a whole bunch of oil in and guessing how much is in there. Okay. So that's, you know, because so, otherwise you you have too much oil, dump the turkey in, it hits the fire when it goes over, and then you have a, a ball of flame. And... Uh, <laughs> The, so we we had that figured out. It took three gallons, and it was perfect, right? You know, just over what the turkey was. Everything else. <clears throat> the other one that actually scared me more, because I knew I wasn't going to overflow this thing, was if it isn't completely thawed. Right. Um, chemistry and physics take over, and you go from um, frozen water inside the turkey instantly to gas <laughs> because of the heat. Yeah. So it basically yeah. makes a small explosion. <laughs> So we made sure. I, was, I was even thinking if you're using water to measure the displacement of it, and then you didn't dry the turkey off enough. Yeah, when we, we putting thought, it in the oil, it would sizzle like mad, right? We thought of that too. We left the turkey all wrapped up and figured out the displacement that way. So we didn't okay. have to waterlog it any more than it already was because it, you oh, know, okay. it does that alone, enough on its own. But I was worried more about the okay if this isn't thawed as much as we think it is. <laughs> yeah. So my wife has a picture of me. Since I, and then I figured, well, if this splashes up, it's I got a Carhartt jacket. It isn't going to get through that, <clears throat> so that I shouldn't have to worry about. I took my face shield for turning, put that on. Figured if it splashes up, I'm going to be safe there. And I, and then I was thinking, wait a minute, my hands are here. And I looked into these cooking gloves and stuff, and I'm like, well, none of these. They all look like cloth stuff. And I figured, right. wait a minute, I work for a place that makes welders, welding right. gloves. Welding gloves will work if it can hold. If it can protect you from molten metal, I'm pretty sure 400 degree oil ain't getting through either. Right. <laughs> so, so she well, had, what were you, how are you lowering it in on some kind of a hook? Well, yeah, it's uh, it's in a basket and it's got a little uh, handle, and then the handle's got a bump on it, so then the hook holds that. And I thought, just in case, if I would drop it or something, I'd rather have gloves on and be safe. And the second yeah. one, I didn't worry as much, so I didn't have my face shield and stuff, but I did still have the gloves because. You know, grabbing the grabbing the pot, the top of the cover, and taking it off, and lowering in there, and knowing you don't have to worry about it. The gloves did make me feel better, but right. yeah, that first picture with me with my welding gloves and my Carhartt jacket, my my face shield, because I was just like, please don't blow up, turkey. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be yeah, funny you, if somebody hid some fireworks inside the oh turkey and you didn't know about it. <laughs> well, and it's it, you know, I think it's because I've seen enough of the YouTube videos of the turkey actually catching fire and stuff and i'm like i know i'm not going to overflow it so we actually ended up deep frying two of them the first one was so good how uh, long did it take it is four minutes per pound plus an extra five minutes so it was about what did we have we had 56 minutes or something like that on the first yeah. one okay. and the second one was about the same weight and we decided you know about four or five more minutes longer would have been fine. Both of them were perfect. The juiciest turkey I have ever had. It was amazing. It was really, really good. I think we found a new way to do the turkey. <laughs> so the turkey was empty inside, though. Yeah, and actually what you need to do is you kind of, like the the back end and the and the neck end, you kind of yeah. clean, clean up a little more than normal. And uh -huh. it, it actually has to have the the passageway for the oil to flow through so you're cooking it from the inside and outside both yeah uh, one if you like turkey wings at all 
you're not going to get them because those things are about as solid and dry and deep fried as you anything you've ever eaten. <laughs> but you the could rest, cut them off though and cook them separately, I guess. Yes, you could cut them off and do them separate. If if you don't yeah. cut them off, they are little bricks on the side of the turkey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's kind of cool when you when you drop it in there, you see the oil going all through the turkey and bubbling up through the center and stuff. And yeah, it and worked. What did you do? What did you do when you pulled it out, like to drain it off? Um, it's got a my, it the basket for mine has, actually has like a hook, so yeah. I kind of left like I I still had I didn't want to put all the weight of the turkey on that hook because I was afraid it would tip a little bit, so I kind of held it a little. But the hook sat there, so it it let it drain there. Then I brought sure. it in and we put it in a pan with a um, just a little wire rack, so anything could drop down underneath to let yeah. it cool a little bit and finish cooking. So yeah, and then when you're cutting it, it's uh leaking oil everywhere or not really no it wasn't that bad it, it's almost like it instantly kind of like seals it and it, it wasn't yeah. the 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 turkey wasn't greasy like the yeah. like a deep fried grease it was more like the juicy turkey turkey juice <laughs> yeah. and it was it was really good and like a dry crackling kind of skin on top on yeah it. Yeah, the yeah. the skin. Um, some of it was almost like if you bake it, and some of it was yeah, that's no good. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's good. So actually, uh, so three gallons. So that's quite a bit of oil, eh? Yes, but I got a like a a giant coffee filter and a big funnel, and yeah. we uh, we drain we strained all the oil, and we can reuse it either when we deep fry chickens or turkeys or even yeah. fish if we wanted to. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so if if I can get out ice fishing this year, we're going to have a fish fry in spring. So hopefully yeah. I find a good spot for perch. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of food, I um uh I was informed by you and I went across it on here and your uh, your site is is looking a little different than it has been. It's got two sides to it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, and that's uh, why I was interested in your turkey. I, um, well, I've one of my one of the things I really love to do, as you know, as a hobby, really, is cooking. And uh, I mentioned on the website, I've I've got it divided now. When you go to passionforwood.com, you get to a page that shows uh, passion for wood on the one side and passion for food on the other side now. <laughs> just so happens changing one letter turns it into passion for food um but yeah i I grew up uh with a hungarian father and a mexican mother and my father is the one that i went to work with and learned how to use my hands and my mother's the person that i constantly cooked and baked with constantly growing up so I've, i've really it's always been a huge part of my life and it's become a big part of my life now and and with my kids like teaching them as well and uh about 5 years ago i was at the uh a woodworking show called the Kitchener Waterloo Woodworking Show and i you know the uh the show owner that hired me to do seminars for years said uh you know we're having more trouble getting women to come to the show you know it's mostly men <clears throat> and we're trying to, you know, come up with some new ideas and stuff. And I said, you know what, I'd be interested in doing a seminar on cooking. And they said, well, you know, it sounds good, but how are you going to tie that in with woodworking? You know, it's a passion for wood. And I said, well, I'm going to do a seminar called um, Woodworking and Cooking, The Connection, because whenever I'm cooking, I'm, I'm thinking about woodworking concepts constantly as I'm as I'm cutting things or mm-hmm. look, looking at growth rings and an onion, that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> So I said, well, I could come up with a pretty neat little seminar that would be kind of a, a, a serious cooking seminar, but also a little bit of a comedy kind of thing, too, like tying it in with woodworking. Sure. So I was actually using hand planes uh, to cut vegetables, and you know, <laughs> I sort of brought some woodworking tools in just, just for fun, but it, was, but it was not meant to be just a joke either. It was, mm-hmm. it was a serious cooking seminar, too. And uh, anyways, they got a lot of positive feedback. They got a lot of women coming to the show to see the seminar, and then they went home and said to their friends, you know, it's, he's doing it again tomorrow if you want to go to the show. And they brought in some new people. And then I decided to do the seminar again um, this past March. Mm-hmm. So that was five years later. I did. Uh, it wasn't the same topic. It was a different cooking seminar. And then. For the last uh, six, eight months, I've been thinking, you know, I really want to turn this into 
something as part of my business as well because I just love to do it and I just don't have much time. You know, I'm lucky to cook on a Sunday and that's it. Yeah. So I decided to add this to my website and offer uh, cooking instruction as well as woodworking instruction and see if I can build up sort of a little little side business within Passion for Wood. That's cool. Yeah, and I know every time I go out there to your site that uh, that the main dish on the front there, I, I want to go and get some of that. <laughs> right. Do you, I mean, do you know much about uh, Hungarian cooking or Mexican um, uh, where you are, I know I like know. eating it. That's about all I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I I grew up in uh, you know about an hour from Toronto, mm -hmm. in a in a small city like a well about a hundred thousand people when I was when I was a kid, and uh, we had we didn't have a lot of minorities, but we definitely had tons of Europeans. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Hungarians, Poles, Yugoslavians, Czechs that kind of thing, German, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so I, I grew up with neighbors who were Italian and Greek and Poles and everything else, and my mother cooked her own Mexican, you know, her own native food from Mexico, mm -hmm. but then she learned to cook Hungarian food, you know, for my father, and then she learned recipes from neighbors from all these different cultures, and, uh, you know, and I was exposed to all that, so... Cool. You know, we're talking about things like uh, cabbage rolls and wiener schnitzel and, mm. well, the one on the website there, chicken paprikash with dumplings. And then there's the Mexican side, uh, you know, just amazing Mexican food that my mother made. And yeah. I, I'm actually going through my mother's old um, recipe books that she wrote herself in Spanish oh, wow. and trying to slowly work through the recipes and translate them into English and that sort of thing. So... Cool. Anyway, so the point is, uh, I love to eat and I love to cook and <laughs> I love to do woodworking. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine them a little bit here if I can. Oh, well, cool. Now, now we'll see we'll see where it leads. You know. Now I know if I get up that way, I know where to get some good food too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, Definitely don't go hungry in a Hungarian Mexican household. <laughs> no, I imagine not. It's we're a we're we're a very predominantly German family and area down here, so a lot of the okay. stuff we have is some heavy but really good stuff. <laughs> it's not always healthy, but no, but tasty. <laughs> yummy. <laughs> yeah, and I've had. Um, it's funny how over the years how many people I've met where <coughs> excuse me where the where the husband was german and the and the and the wife was mexican like it, it it's actually a, a very common combination uh oh. german mexican you know there's a lot of germans that emigrated to mexico yeah. way back so um it's not that unusual of a combination um but it's all good it's all good food <laughs> we uh we we um oh i can't remember the name of the pastry right now it's not it's not pastry it's a um like a noodle but uh spatzel uh-huh. Yeah. We we love spatzel and we'll, we'll Well that's make... what I mean that's what I mean by the dumplings with the chicken paprika. Oh, okay. It's basically like a spatzel but but I do it with uh with a spoon instead of like a spatzel maker. Oh, okay. The spatzel maker, you know, you can buy it kinda of looks like a, a little carriage and it's kinda of like a cheese grater kind of idea. Yep. You put a ball of dough in it and you slide it back and forth over the boiling water and you get these little bits of dough falling through the holes mm -hmm. but when you make it the way my mother used to which is just with a spoon the pieces are much bigger and it has a pretty different texture like i actually prefer it that way but it takes so much longer to make it <laughs> anyway so that's what i mean by i just call it dumplings like for for the canadians to understand what i'm talking about <laughs> cool yeah now you're making me hungry i'm gonna have to go upstairs pretty soon <laughs> and, and you know i mean the other kind of interesting thing like a few years back i had a i had a couple come here from colorado for a woodworking course mm -hmm. and you know quite often when we're just chatting away during the week you know we somehow get onto food mm -hmm. in some way you know i'm recommending restaurants for them to try in the area and that kind of thing and uh and they said oh well you know will you come to our uh shop to help us uh set up woodworking equipment and fine-tune it and all that and i said oh absolutely i do that so 
it was maybe I don't know four or five months later they flew me out to Colorado to uh, work with them there. But anyway, somehow we got on the topic of cooking and how much I love to cook and everything else. And then, and then uh, the, the 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 wife that was here with her husband mm-hmm. taking the course, she she said to my wife, you know, would it be too forward of me to ask Kendrick if if uh, kind of as a as a condition of the woodworking course that he has to cook us a meal as well? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you know what, go for it. He loves cooking. <laughs> so so I fly to Colorado. I'm working in their shop for, I don't know, six days or something, and then I'm also making up a menu and cooking them this special <laughs> dinner one night, right? And, I mean, I love doing it. It's just, it sounds weird when you think of it that way, but, you know, it just sort of gets me thinking, gee, I mean, I do travel a few times a year to teach woodworking, and, you know, it would be fun to just work with somebody in their shop for three days and then spend a couple of days in the kitchen teaching some uh, cooking as well, you know, because I really, really love doing it. So cool. anyway, so we'll see what happens, you know, sure. when I started, when I started offering uh, woodworking seminars here, it was about 11 years ago. And I remember starting with maybe, maybe 40 names of people I collected at a woodworking show mm-hmm. and it grew to over 900 people. Yeah. So now with the cooking, you know, I'm starting with a small list again, and we'll see, you know, if it uh, if it's something that catches on, then it could be a lot of fun. That sounds great. Well, I hope it does. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, if anyone interested in uh, just reading about it, just go to passionforwood.com, and you'll now see the cooking and the woodworking side, and you can click on a few cooking pages, see some pictures of some of my stuff, and and uh, see where it goes from there. Cool. Yep, and every time I go there, I have to go and eat something because it makes me hungry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was putting together the new the, the new site of the website, I was sending my webmaster pictures and stuff, but I was like, gee, you know, it's not like I take pictures of the food I make all the time, so mm-hmm. it's not like I have a whole bunch of pictures, so I, you know, kind of threw together a bunch of dishes and a bunch of pictures and kind of repeated them through the website but now it's like every every Sunday I'm cooking something new with our kids and then I'm trying to get good photographs of it and I'm sending new photos to my webmaster like every week here's another dish I just did put it up <laughs> well, that's cool. like, wow that looked yummy <laughs> and and the family yeah you need to make other people hungry and the family gets to try new stuff <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and I mean it's it's really uh you know growing up in a sort of European household to me, the kitchen was always the the focal point of the house. Like I did homework in the kitchen, sitting at the kitchen table. It was mm-hmm. not not like hidden away in my room or something. Yep. And uh, you know, for me to do that now with my kids, I mean, it's just amazing how interested they are. Mm-hmm. You know, they're ten and twelve, and um, you know, you kind of think, oh, most kids just say, I don't want to do it or whatever. But they're like right in there. How do you do that? Can I try? I want to try it and. And then, you know, we sit down and have a nice meal together, and it's really an amazing thing to do as a family. So cool. that's what I'll be doing over the Christmas holidays, <laughs> more cooking. Yeah, and we'll be, we we do a big uh, Christmas Eve, we do a, a big thing where we have all the different candies and cookies and hors d'oeuvres and more more munchies than a meal, so we just eat all day. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to do it. <laughs> After Christmas, I have to go to the gym a lot. <laughs> yeah. Use the hand plane more. Yeah, yeah. and that <laughs> both, and I still somehow gained weight. <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose, well, hey, everybody get a chance, go and check out uh, Hendrick's site, and if you have any questions, like always, feel free to leave them on the, uh, uh, shoot us a email on the contact page or a comment, or you can always Skype us and leave a voicemail, too, so... We look forward to talking again. It'll be next year when we get a chance to be on here again, but we will be doing another one in January. And to everybody out there, and you too, Hendrik, uh, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. (laughs) Yeah, same to you. Have a a nice rest and try to get rested up for 2013. Yep, here it comes. (laughs) Like it or not, right? (laughs) Yeah, see what's around the corner. All right, thank you, Hendrik. Okay, have a nice holiday then. I'll talk to you uh, next year then. Thank you.